We now turn our attention to a discussion of an often underappreciated topic, descriptive statistics. We will introduce common numerical and graphical descriptive statistics and discuss their use in the process of data analysis. Let's return for a moment to a slide from the introductory lecture in Module 1 to put our current discussion in context. After identifying a hypothesis in a population of interest and conducting a design study using a random sample of data from that population, we are ready to do some statistics. Our first task should be to calculate numerical and graphical descriptive statistics for the sample. The goal here is to use basic statistical quantities to summarize the structure in our data and provide a description of the sample we have collected. It's important to note that at this point in the process we are not focused on making population inferences. We should back up one step further. Before calculating descriptive statistics, it's important to actually look at the raw data in the data set. Although this kind of basic examination may not provide great insight into understanding structure and patterns in the data, it can provide information about whether the individual level data is accurate and makes sense. One can eyeball the values for different variables in the data set to see if they are generally in line with clinical expectations. Here we see a snapshot of the blood pressure data which was used for a homework exercise in Module 2. We can quickly see that values for things like sex, systolic blood pressure, and diastolic blood pressure are within expected clinical ranges. It is also a good idea to scan the raw data for the presence of missing values and to note how missing values are indicated or coded in the raw data. There are no missing values shown in the data snapshot provided here. It is especially important to examine the consistency of categorical variables that have been created from continuous variables. Here we see BMI, a continuous variable, and bin BMI, a categorical variable with three levels, 25 or below representing lean, 25 to 30 representing overweight, and above 30 representing obese. Scanning the BMI and bin BMI columns provides a quick check that the bin categories match up properly with their actual BMI values. This kind of check can and should be performed in a more systematic way using the descriptive techniques we will discuss in this module. But it is always a good idea to simply look at the raw data and make sure that things make sense. Descriptive statistics calculated from inaccurate or nonsensical data values will be meaningless. The process of summarizing a clinical data set using descriptive statistics is a crucial first step in understanding the results of a clinical research investigation and serves several important functions. Descriptive statistics can be used to summarize the main features and characteristics of a sample of data quantitatively. A critical part of this summary involves describing participant flow from enrollment through protocol completion. Another important purpose of this summary is to characterize the sample with regard to clinical generalizability of results. From a more statistical perspective, descriptive statistics can help inform the clinical research team on how to proceed with analysis. This involves examining the shape or distribution of key variables in the sample to determine if statistical assumptions of planned analyses are met. Further, the identification of unusual observations may have important clinical implement implications and can also impact the performance of statistical tests or models. How do we actually perform a descriptive analysis? The two primary classification categories of descriptive summaries are numerical and graphical. Within each of those categories, we can subclassify descriptive summaries as those that are intended for continuous data and those intended for categorical data. For numerical summaries of continuous data, such as systolic blood pressure values, which is one of the examples we will use in this module, we will describe several summary measures intended to characterize the central tendency, mean and median, and the amount of spread, standard deviation in interquartile range, present in a set of data values. For categorical data, such as gender or BMI category, we will use counts or frequencies and percentages. 
For graphical summaries, we will focus on graphs for continuous data and introduce two commonly used summaries, the histogram and box plot. Before demonstrating actual calculations of numerical and descriptive summaries, let's start with an illustration of descriptive statistics in action using a recent article published in Fertility and Sterility. We will examine several figures and tables from the article and discuss the descriptive summaries presented. Our case illustration is a randomized controlled trial published in Fertility and Sterility in August of 2010 that examined the impact on pregnancy rates of GnRH agonist administration at the time of implantation in intrauterine insemination cycles. The sample consisted of 344 women undergoing intrauterine insemination. The primary outcome of the trial was pregnancy rate defined as a positive beta HCG result after an IUI cycle. The intervention group with a total N of 172 participants received a single sub subcutaneous injection of 0.1 milligram triptorolin eight days after HCG administration, while the control or placebo arm with a total N of 172 participants received a similar injection containing solvent only. The results of the study showed that the pregnancy rate per randomized patient was similar in both groups of the study, being 22.7% in the intervention group compared to 22.1% in the placebo group. Let's start with figure one from the manuscript. Note the title, Consolidated Standards of Reporting Trials Statement Flow Diagram. This is more commonly known as the consort flow diagram, which is a required reporting element of the consort statement. The consort statement was developed by investigators and journal editors to help authors improve reporting of randomized controlled trials by using a checklist and flow diagram. It offers a standard way for authors to prepare reports of trial findings, facilitating their complete and transparent reporting, and aiding their critical appraisal and interpretation. The most up-to-date revision of the consort statement is Consort 2010 at www.consort-statement.org. Many of the top medical journals require investigators to comply with the consort statement reporting guidelines. The consort flow diagram is intended to, de to depict the passage of participants through a randomized trial and depicts information from four stages of a trial, enrollment, intervention allocation, follow-up, and analysis. As you can see, the flow diagram for this study only includes information on three of these four stages. There is no information in the diagram or elsewhere in the manuscript for that matter, describing the enrollment process which would include how many individuals were assessed for eligibility, how many were excluded, and reasons for exclusion such as being ineligible, declined to participate, etc. We do see that 172 individuals were randomized to each group. Additionally, 31 out of 172, or 18% of individuals in the treatment group, and 22 out of 172, or 13% of individuals in the placebo group, did not receive their assigned interventions because they failed to show up for treatment. We see from the follow-up portion of the diagram that none of those individuals who received treatment were lost to follow-up. As a result, 141 individuals in the treatment group and 150 individuals in the placebo group were included in the final data analysis. Let's focus a little more on the issue of missing data. Figure 1 indicates that the data analysis was focused on the 141 participants from group A and 150 from group B. What about the 53 participants who are considered missing? 31 from group A and 22 from group B. Missing data should be carefully described as part of the descriptive summary of a data set and needs to be carefully considered throughout data analysis process. Questions to think about include, is there information about why subjects are missing? 
Is the missing data rate similar between the treatment groups in the study? Do the missing subjects have similar demographic and ovarian stimulation parameter characteristics as the analyzed subjects? If not, what potential biases may there be that could affect the analysis and results of the study? How is the missing data handled in the formal statistical analyses of the study? In thinking about these questions, we note that the manuscript doesn't provide any information on ineligibles or refusals. It also does not characterize whether those missing the intervention were different than those who received the intervention. Let's move on to the statistical analysis section of the article shown here. Let's pick out the portions most relevant to our discussion of descriptive statistics. Categoric data were expressed as number and percentage, numeric data as mean and standard deviation. These represent standard approaches for describing categorical and numeric or continuous data. Here we have Table 1, which contains baseline characteristics and ovarian stimulation parameters in patients randomized to receive triptoralin or placebo. All variables in this table are inherently continuous and are summarized using the mean and standard deviation. The mean provides a measure of center of the data values and the standard deviation a measure of the spread of the data values. For the moment, Let's simply ignore the p-value column. We will come back and discuss this in a later module. The summary data for the two intervention groups is presented in columns and the number of subjects per group is indicated in the first row of the table and matches the analysis numbers from figure 1. The summary statistics in this table provide information both on general characteristics of the sample as well as comparability of the treatment groups with respect to relevant baseline characteristics. The general profile of subjects is clearly important with regard to the type of individuals to which the study conclusions can be applied. Given that this is a randomized trial and participants are randomly allocated to each treatment group, we would expect these baseline variables to be balanced across the groups with respect to the distribution of their individual values and hence their means and standard deviations. This is a key point as the random allocation process used for treatment assignment allows the assumption of marginal equality of the groups with respect to all pre-randomization characteristics. This marginal equality is the basis for inferential claims that treatment is responsible for observed outcome variable differences between the groups. Looking at the first three characteristics listed, age in years, duration of infertility in years, and body mass index in kilograms per meter squared, we see very comparable means and standard deviations for the groups. From a practical perspective, it is unlikely that these group differences a tenth of a year in age, 0.06 year difference in duration of inf infertility, or a 0.4 difference in BMI would result in bias between the groups with regard to pregnancy rate. A similar comparative process can be applied to all variables listed in the table. Here we have Table 2, which shows clinical outcomes in patients by group. The variables in this table are all categorical, and in fact dichotomous, and are summarized using counts and percentages. For the moment, let's ignore both the relative risk and p-value columns. We will come back and discuss these in a later module. We are primarily concerned with a descriptive summary of these variables for the purpose of our current discussion. By providing both the frequency counts of individuals who experience the outcome, along with the percentages, the reader has the necessary information to assess and compare the groups. Given that these are the clinical outcomes of the study, formal statistical assessments and inference are ultimately of obvious interest. However, it is important to note that frequencies and percentages are all that is needed to make a practical comparison of the groups with regard to whether or not there are clinically meaningful differences in outcomes between the groups. Let's stop our discussion of the article at this point. 
we will revisit aspects of this study in later modules. This is the end of segment one of the Descriptive Statistics lecture.